Senator Rennick. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator Babbitt. And uh, you've touched on many good issues there. And I too support this motion because at the end of the day, uh, what will start off as a $100 billion investment will end up much, much more than that. Uh, because that figure has been actually quoted quite a few times and it was first quoted a few years ago. So it would already be considerably much, much more uh, than what is quoted here. And uh, I know, actually, I'm glad we've got Senator McAllister. I've asked her, uh, in estimates, uh, have they actually, how are they tracking the cost of transmission lines up till 2030? Uh, how many kilometres of transmission lines are needed by 2030? And of course, we can never get a straight answer on any of this sort of information. Uh, and we know, of course, that you know renewables not only destroy the environment, you know, whether it's our biodiversity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it's also going to destroy our economy. And we've touched on this many times this afternoon and previously in the chamber. Uh, but I will uh, take up uh, Senator Babbitt's comment about uh, the science isn't settled, uh, because I actually think the science has been quite settled uh, for quite a while. Uh, and it's actually called the ideal gas law. It's actually CO2 is actually a gas. Uh, and one of the things that really annoys me about this argument, actually, and so it's more from the greenhouse effect in the climate change. And the problem with climate change is, is that that's an immeasurable uh, uh, KPI. You can't actually measure climate change. And it states the obvious, because at the end of the day, you know, you're often asked, do you believe in climate change? Well, guess what? Climate change isn't a religion. It's not something you believe in. It's something you understand. Now, I think we all agree that the Earth spins on its axis uh, every 24 hours, rotates around the sun every 365 days, has a slight tilt because of the gravity pull from the moon, which gives us our seasons. And then you know, we know, and Kepler and uh, Tycho Brahe came up with this stuff in the late 1600s, early 1700s, that the Earth uh, travels in an ellipse. Uh, so all of these factors will contribute to a change in the climate. That's not the issue. The point is whether or not you want to believe that CO2 actually traps heat, because that's, that was the initial argument that somehow suddenly CO2 traps heat. Well, of course, that is an oxymoronic statement, because heat is kinetic energy. It is the energy of motion. So if you were to believe that CO2 was to trap heat, as these people say, then the actual temperature would drop, because temperature is a, me a measure of mean molecular momentum. Right, so the slower the molecules move, the colder it gets. So yet again, the logic is completely flawed. But not only that, what they don't tell you is, is they love to say that nitrogen and oxygen are transparent uh, to um, radiation as it bounces off the Earth. Well, guess what? CO2 is pretty much transparent to radiation that bounces off the Earth as well, uh, except, for a, except in a couple of frequencies. And uh, all molecules uh, have what's known as a spectral fingerprint. And uh, you can tell how many spectral fingerprints a molecule will have because you will take the molecule, the number of molecules in an atom or um, an atom in a, atom, atoms in a molecule. You'll time, and if it's a linear um, uh, molecule, you'll times it by three and minus six. And if it's a nonlinear uh, molecule, you'll times it by three and uh, subtract five. So CO2 has three molecules times it by three. It's a uh, linear, uh, non-linear uh, uh, molecule because you've got the carbon and then your two uh, oxygens that make it a triangular shape. So you get four uh, spectral fingerprints and they all have what's known as a vibrational frequency. And it's very similar to something like surfing a wave. If you want to actually catch a wave, you've actually got to paddle onto the wave, be travelling in the right direction and about the same speed to actually get on the wave. So it works the same way for carbon dioxide. But here's the rub. One of the actual vibrational frequencies at which CO2 absorbs uh, photons that come from the sun is actually at the uh, 2.8 micron uh, phase. And of course, 2.8 microns is actually incoming radiation. Now, for some particular reason, these people who have come up with this greenhouse, effect, you know, greenhouse gas effect theory have seemed to want to ignore the fact, and, and the head of the CSIRO has admitted this to me in estimates, that uh, CO2 absorbs radiation at 2.8 mi microns. Now, it is true that it also absorbs radiation or absorbs photons on the way out at 14.8 microns. So the four, the four vibrational frequencies, just so you know, is at 2.8 
microns, 4.2 microns, and then two uh, uh, um, vibrational frequencies at 14.8. Now, the reason why that matters is, is that we know from Planck's law e equals HV that effectively the incoming radiation uh, is actually that the CO2 absorbs is actually five times stronger than the outgoing uh, photons it absorbs. And of course, they never take that into account in their calculations. Just like uh, when it comes to the actual net zero modelling, they don't take into account the impact of phytoplankton, uh, which is kind of crazy given that that absorbs 70 per cent of the world's CO2 anyway. Uh, but that is something that uh, is completely overlooked. And of course, the other thing that they completely overlook is Albert Einstein's uh, paper uh, uh, that he did in 1917, the quantum theory on radiation. And in page 14, he says the Maxwellian effect uh, uh, can be ignored. Now, James Clark Maxwell uh, was a brilliant Scottish uh, physicist who uh, determined in the middle 19th century that both uh, electricity, light and magnetism were basically different manifestations of the same phenomenon. Okay? And this matters. Uh, and Einstein went on to say in 1917 in his paper, page 14, or I can quote the page number if you like, uh, is that radiation is so insignificant in regards to the other properties uh, that it effectively drops out. Uh, and those other properties, of course, are convection and, radio, uh, convection and conduction. Now, that's a very important point to make, because what that means is, and we know this, we see this every day, uh, is this thing called the wind. Okay? And that's convection. And what that does is that follows the second law of thermodynamics that says the entropy of a system must always increase. And what does that mean is that it is constantly taking heat okay, and lifting it up into the atmosphere. And if you actually go and look at the height of the troposphere, you will see uh, that in the, at the equator it is 16 kilometres high and at the poles it's about 6 kilometres high. What does that mean? It means that heat is carried up uh, and taken out to space at the equator. And interestingly enough, if you look at the maximum and minimum, minimum temperatures of uh, locations around the globe, and I'll use Singapore for example, the maximum temperature in Singapore, I think, is about 32. The, the, you know, I'm talking the record maximum temperature here. So that is actually much lower, uh, for example, than somewhere like in the middle of Australia where it's very dry and the maximum temperature can hit up to 50 degrees. And why is that? Because the molecules, the greenhouse gas effect, and or what these people refer to, doesn't actually exist. It actually cools. And when I say cools, it works both ways. It reduces the volatility between maximum and minimum temperatures. But I just want to call out these models because if we actually look at the energy budget given to me by the CSIRO, they claim that the downwelling ra radiation from CO2 is 342 watts per square metre. Yet the sun, the amount of uh, energy that comes from the sun is 161 watts per square metre. That is absolutely absurd to think that CO2 has twice the energy of the radiation from the sun. Th thank you. Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.